rather than really brittle instability, I'll be talking about a slightly simpler variant of brittle instability. So um, rather than trying to relate complex geometry to brittle instability, it'll instead be a slightly simpler and certainly much less technical uh, variant. Okay, so br brittle instability conditions are uh, these days very popular, very heavily studied, especially in the UK. And people studying them have not really tried to take up the uh, question of what the complex geometry of brittle instability conditions is. There's been some work in some special cases, but no general framework in which you can study these questions. So basically what, what we were trying to do was to come up with some general framework in which you can study brittle instability conditions. And I should say on, on the complex geometry side, these are always on holomorphic vector bundles. And so these are brittle instability conditions on the derived category of coherent sheaves or some analog of that, but really I'll just be considering stability of, of vector bundles themselves. And this whole story is a general philosophy that goes back to the 1980s through the, the Hitchin Kobashi correspondence. Um, so I'll just describe this motivation, the Hitchin Kobashi correspondence, which is yeah, so a fantastic piece of math or mathematics from the, the 1980s, due to very many people starting even before the 1980s. Um, but it's especially developed by people like Donaldson, Ulenbeck, and Yao. So is, is my video working? Can, can you see the video or it is working? Okay, good. Um, okay, so we'll let XL be a variety. Uh, so XL be a smooth polarized variety. So what this means is that L is an ample line bundle. And I'm interested in questions about complex geometry. So this will always be over the complex numbers and we'll take omega in C1 of L, a Kähler metric. And any choice will do. I, I won't impose any, any conditions on omega whatsoever beyond it being a Kähler metric. And the, the key input is a holomorphic vector bundle E over XL. So this is a holomorphic vector bundle. Okay, so then fitting into this um, general framework, trying to relate complex geometry to stability conditions, the Hitchin Kobayashi correspondence relates on the complex geometry side, what's called a Hermite Einstein metric to a stability condition, which is called uh, slope stability. So this is something that long predates uh, Bridgeling's theory. So to define slope stability of a vector bundle, what's useful is to set the slope of a vector bundle, mu of e, to be L to the n minus one, so let's see one of e over the rank of e. So the rank. Uh, it's by, so it's, it's really the degree of e divided by the rank. So this is this is some rational number uh, called the slope of E. So this, uh, I suppose, is maybe defined by uh, Mumford or Gieseker or someone like that. And then one makes the, the definition of what stability of a vector bundle means in this sense, so what's called slope stability. So we say that E is then slope stable. And it's, it's a condition then on, on coherent subsheaves of E. So if for all coherent subsheaves, I'll try to always write my subsheaves as S sitting inside E, we have uh, mu of S is less than mu of E. Okay, and S cannot be E in this case, so it has to be a non-trivial subsheaf. Um, okay, so what does this mean? This means that as you're comparing the degree of E divided by the rank of E with the same quantity for subsheaves, so deg S over rank S. 
this is a, one of the, the first very prominent notions of stability in algebraic geometry that makes sense for holomorphic vector bundles or more generally for coherent sheaves. And it was originally defined um, in relation to uh, geometric invariant theory, I suppose, but especially defined in relation to complex geometry. So the, the complex geometry, uh, the complex geometric counterpart of slope stability is the notion of a Hermes Einstein metric. So for this, we'll take H, a Hermitian metric. On E, so E, remember, is our holomorphic vector bundle. And the Hermitian metric has an induced curvature operator. So this is uh, F, H. So this is a section, this is a two form with values in N, Z. So taking a Hermitian metric induces some curvature, which is a uh, two form with values in N, Z. So it's a smooth section of the sky. We want to define the complex differential geometry. So this is a, a partial differential equation essentially. And it's what's called the notion of a Hermes Einstein metric. So then E is, or H is a Hermes Einstein metric. if the contraction of the curvature is actually constant. So if the contraction of I of H is actually equal to lambda times the identity on NT for some lambda in R, which again actually is even a rational number. Um, so what's, what's the point here? So this definition, uh, you start off with the curvature, which is a two form with values in ND. Contraction uh, removes this uh, two form part and leaves you with a section of ND, the endomorphism um, bundle of E. And what you're asking is that actually this is a constant multiple of the identity endomorphism of our vector bundle E. And so I'll just write this equivalently. So equivalently, explicitly explaining what this contraction operator is, you could ask that I of H, where H omega to the N minus one is equal to lambda omega to the N tensor the identity on NZ. So now these are both uh, NN forms with values in NZ. Okay, and, and this is really just the definition of what the contraction means. So what's the point? We have this stability notion in algebraic geometry. We've got this notion in complex differential geometry of a Hermes Einstein metric and the fantastic theorem due to originally Donaldson in the case of projective surfaces and then Ullenbeck and Yao and then actually reproved by Donaldson shortly after Ullenbeck and Yao in general. So we suppose that E is a simple vector bundle. So simple is just, uh, it has no non-trivial automorphism. So it means that uh, H0 of ND is just generated by the identity on ND, sorry, ID sub ND. So the identity automorphism. Then this, uh, this fantastic piece of mathematics tells you that the existence of a Hermes Einstein metric is actually equivalent to slope stability of the vector bundle. So then E is slope stable. This purely algebra geometric condition, if and only if E admits a Hermes Einstein metric. So HE standing for Hermes Einstein metric. So this is really saying that you can solve this partial differential equation, this Hermes Einstein condition, if and only if this slope stability condition holds. So the, the easier direction is that the existence of a Hermes Einstein metric implies slope stability. And that is due to uh, Lupka and someone else who I've forgotten, um, I, I think possibly Kobayashi. But uh, yes, I, I should say, uh, as, as was mentioned earlier, I'm really a variety kind of guy. So I'm slightly uh, beginning to learn the theory of vector bundles for some stability and so on. Anyway, this was a fantastically important result that had many applications, especially to four dimensional topology through Donaldson's work. But I'll just make some remarks that emphasize what the point of this sort of result actually is. So why is one interested in showing that some algebra geometric condition is equivalent to some complex differential geometry condition? 
Well, first of all, the, the first reason you might be interested is that actually Hermite Einstein metrics are unique. So a given holomorphic vector bundle has many, many Hermitian metrics, and Hermite Einstein metrics actually give you a canonical choice. So this gives uh, maybe a canonical uh, differential geometry, differential geometric structure on E. So this says that you can put a canonical Hermitian metric on your vector bundle if and only if it's slope stable, this condition from algebraic geometry. Of course, from the point of view of algebraic geometry, this is very obvious in retrospect, but was um, something that took some time to develop. The, the real point is to construct moduli spaces. So one can form moduli, and this is Maybe the only mention of moduli is the item in the, the uh, title of the conference. But so one can form moduli of slope stable uh, vector bundles over our fixed polarized variety XL. And in particular, you get two natural compactifications, one coming from the algebraic geometry, where you allow slope polystable coherent sheaves, and the other from the differential geometry, where you allow these uh, so-called weak Hermite-Einstein uh, connections. So I guess algebraic geometry, algebra geometric, and differential geometric compactifications. And of course, people like uh, compact moduli spaces because you can integrate over them and that allows you to do a numerous of geometry, for example. And I should say, actually, that it's still an open problem to get very firm results on the uh, relationship between the algebra geometric and differential geometric compactifications. This is still ongoing research, but it's a fairly complete result is uh, due to uh, Daniel Greb, Mate Toma, Ben Sibley, and Richard Wentworth from a couple of years ago. And they don't exactly show that the two compactifications are isomorphic, but they, they at least get a finite map between them. So from the point of view of an algebraic geometry conference, I want to promote the idea that some problems are more easily understood if you have a differential geometric um, approach to these moduli spaces. So some problems are, say, more suited to differential geometry. I'll yeah, mention some of these. Uh, for example, the topology of moduli spaces. Uh, there's, uh, for example, important work of Francis Corwin understanding the um, topology of moduli spaces of vector bundles, stable vector bundles, that uh, goes back as well to Atiyah and Bosch. There are other problems you can ask about moduli spaces that really are questions in differential geometry and hence need differential geometric tools to answer. For example, an important question is always what the curvature of spaces is, and that's a question that's most well suited to differential geometry rather than algebraic geometry. So when you construct moduli spaces using differential geometry, you usually get uh, vp Jason metrics on the moduli spaces, for example. So you get some kind of canonical geometric structure on the moduli spaces themselves. A final remark that will be more important in motivating what's to come rather than in motivating the importance of the Hitchin Kobayashi correspondence is that if I take the vector bundle E over XL, this is uh, slope stable. If and only if E over XKL is slope stable. Or K should be positive. So this, this is saying that the notion of slope stability is invariant under scaling the line bundle, the polarization that you're considering. So this ample line bundle. Okay, and um, so before turning to the kind of Bridgeland stability uh, complex geometry stuff that's really uh, the, the novelty of this talk, I want to rephrase slope stability in a way that's completely familiar to anyone working in Bridgeland stability, but is perhaps less so for those of us who mostly don't. Um, so we'll consider the following setup. Z is a function from the growth in the group of X to C where, okay, so k of x 
This is the Grozendy group of coherent sheaves. What this means, this is um, coherent sheaves. up to if there's a short exact sequence like this, then you identify E with S plus Q. This gives you a, a group structure. Um, okay, and the, the point, what does it mean for Z to be a function then from coherent sheaves, uh, this growth and group to the complex number is really, it means that Z is additive in short exact sequences. So Z is additive in short exact sequences. Okay, and the, the function that we'll consider is very explicit. So Z of E is equal to I times the rank of E minus the degree of E. So again, explicitly this is minus L to the N minus one dot C one of L, or so you want to be uh, plus I times the rank of E. So this is a complex number. And again, and maybe I actually didn't say it earlier, but N is the dimension of X always. Okay, and then the, the point is that you can rephrase mu of F is less than mu of E. This is the same thing as asking the argument of Z of F to be less than the argument z of e. So this is the argument of a complex number. So I'll draw this pictorially in such a way that it will become obvious that the statement is true. Let's say this is z of f. So what does this mean? This means that z has positive degree and rank, I don't know, maybe about two in c. And maybe this is z of e. So in slope stability, what you're comparing, or comparing basically is the slope of these two lines. Whereas in this kind of um, perspective where you use this function z, what you're comparing instead are the two angles, say uh, phi f and this bigger angle phi e. So the angle for f is smaller than that of the angle of e. And that's reflected by the slopes uh, being having this inequality relating them. Okay, and I'll always set I of E is the argument of Z of E. And the point really is just that all of these numbers are in the upper half plane inside C, so I can compare these arguments. Okay, good. So now I'm gonna turn to more modern developments. So this is a notion that is a fairly minor variant of what's appeared in the Bridgeland stability literature, but really seems not to have explicitly appeared in the Bridgeland stability literature to our knowledge, which we call Z stability. So Z is this function, well, a variant of these sorts of functions uh, involved in defining our notion of stability. And I'll say again that this is now all joint work with uh, John McCarthy and L. Larry's second one. And okay, so while this is joint work of us, the notion is a very small variant of what's appeared in the Bridgeland stability literature before. So uh, of course, I'm, I'm not gonna try and define Bridgeland stability. I'm not an expert in Bridgeland stability. Uh, so Bridgeland stability really it involves the following amongst many, many other things. Right. And first of all, involves a triangulated category, which I'll write D. You're supposed to think of um, the derived category of coherent sheaves on X, but I actually don't know what a triangulated category is. So uh, this is the only example I know. Um, okay, and it involves crucially a central charge And so a central charge will be function Z from the growth and D group of this triangulated category to the complex numbers. So again, this is uh, adjective and short exact sequences. And there is some condition like what we saw before that it sends some class of objects of the triangulated category to the upper half plane. So it sends E inside D to H inside C, the upper half plane.
if E is in the house of the triangular isocosal gradient, so E is in the house of D. Okay, and, and again, I'll be completely honest and say I, I don't know what a triangulated category is, and in particular, I don't know what it means to have the house of a triangulated category, but I think you're supposed to think of um, coherent sheaves as the, the house of DB, uh, the, the derived category of coherent sheaves, up to some torsion elements or something. And then there's some condition, finally, bridge line stability involves a condition like phi of F less than phi of E, where again, phi is the argument of Z of E, so, so, sorry, uh, phi. Uh, of E is the argument of Z of E. So it, it involves this condition phi of F less than phi of E when F is a subobject of E. And again, some care is needed in making this precise. And okay, th this is not supposed to be the definition. There are many, many other properties that Bridgeland requires, such as this slightly mysterious support property. Um, and in particular, all of this stuff makes it very, very hard to construct Bridgeland stability conditions. So we'll be more motivated by the, the kind of scheme in which Bridgeland makes his definition rather than the actual definition itself, which will be completely irrelevant. We won't need any triangulated categories or hearts of anything uh, like that. But I'll make two remarks. One is that this is very closely related and motivated by Douglas's work in string theory. So motivated very closely by Douglas's work in string theory. And okay, um, Douglas was really just working on uh, the derived category of coherent sheaves rather than an arbitrary triangulated category. And yes, uh, of course, Bridgeland's definition is a very mathematically precise version of what Douglas was, was trying to do as, as is clear from Bridgeland's introduction uh, to his, his famous paper on this topic. And it's very hard to construct. So this is the other remark I want to make. Uh, Chen Yi Li's recent breakthrough of constructing a Bridgeland stability condition on the derived category of coherent sheaves on the quintic threefolds, this Clavier threefold. So I, I don't know, I guess that's the really the first particularly non-trivial example of a Bridgeland stability condition on a Clavier threefold on the, the derived category. There have been more examples, uh, I guess, Bridgeland on elliptic curves and K3 surfaces, um, other people on FANOS, especially Chen Yi Li, and uh, well. A lot of it goes back, back to these um, variants of the Bogomolov Kisaker inequality that was uh, conjectured uh, possibly by Bayer, McCree, and Toda. But yes, I, I may have gotten some names wrong, and if so, I apologize. So, okay, so th this is a, a deficit of the theory. It's very hard to construct these things, but it's a very good thing if you can actually construct them. Um, okay, so we'll consider a variant. So we consider something that's very easy to construct instead. And it's what we call Z stability for Z a central uh, charge. So Z a central charge. And this is really motivated quite closely by work of uh, Arnold Bayer. So Z in particular sends K of X so this is coherent sheaves up to um, isomorphism when you have a short exact sequence to the complex numbers. So in particular, this assigns to every holomorphic vector bundle or coherent sheaf a complex number. Uh, but we'll only consider central charges of the following form. So the input will be, first of all, what's called a stability vector. So this is a sequence of complex numbers that don't vanish. So this is MC star. The n plus one will require that the imaginary part of row n is positive. This is basically just a normalization and will require that the or imaginary part of row d over row d minus one is strictly positive uh, for all d. And that's, that's a non-trivial condition in comparison to the first one. This is what uh, Bayer calls a stability vector. Will require an ample line bundle. So L will be an ample line bundle as before. Uh, we'll require a class U inside H star of XC. So what does this mean? This is some cohomology class where U is of the form one plus W, where W is in 
positive cohomology. Uh, and I'll, I'll give some examples of the sorts of things we have in mind when we have this operator U. Uh, and actually a technical condition that will be important is that the, the degree two part of this cohomology class is actually a real form. So in general, we just require that it's uh, complex. So this is a technical condition that one can weaken a little bit. Um, okay, and then we can write Z omega k, so it depends on a, an integer, a positive integer k in this input, say omega, which is rho u l. Okay, and this will be a complex number associated to E that takes the form the integral over x of the sum from d equals zero to n rho d k to the d l to the d dot the total term class of E dot u. Okay, and I mean, it involves a lot of input, but the point is that this is a very general construction and it's completely easy to write down examples. Um, so I'll just give some examples of the sorts of functions, said, sorts of central charge you should uh, keep in mind is particularly interesting. But I'll just uh, make clear from the start that this is essentially exactly what was considered by Bayer in one of his papers from the mid 2000s. The, the second remark I want to make is that these are extremely easy to construct. You're just writing down some combination of train characters. There, there's no hypotheses to satisfy whatsoever. And okay, the, the final thing is the, the conditions on the stability vector have a, a nice consequence. So you get that for any E, a, a coherent sheaf, you get that set K of E, or maybe, sorry, uh, every E uh, a vector bundle at least, you get that set K of E is inside H uh, for all very large. Okay, and actually, sorry, this is true for um, coherent sheaves in general. So the, the point is, at least in the, the large K regime, then what you get is you always land in the upper half plane, which is the sort of thing that's actually very non-trivial to get satisfied for um, Bridgeland stability conditions themselves. Okay, and then just as in the Bridgeland theory, we'll set phi K of E. This is the argument of said k omega or omega k, sorry. Yes, uh, said omega k of e. Okay, we can then form our notion of stability. So this is what you should think of as the version or variant of uh, Britain's stability that's of interest to us. So then e is called asymptotically uh, z-stable. If we're all f sitting inside here, uh, e a coherent subsheaf, you have the appropriate um, inequality of arguments. So you have phi k of f is less than phi k of e. But because we're interested in this large K regime, this is what asymptotically means, this will only need to be true for K very large. Okay, and this is uh, of interest, particularly as pointed out by Bayer, this is of interest in the large volume regime. So this, this is what Bayer was studying in relation to his uh, polynomial Bridgeland stability conditions. We're really considering something different where we just consider coherent subsheaves, but we require analogous inequalities. Okay, so let me make one remark that the notion should be of interest away from this large volume regime where you just fix a K and ask that the inequality holds for that, that fixed K. So this uh, makes sense for smaller K in the sense that you, you just fix K rather than only considering the large volume limit, which is when K tends to infinity. Okay, and the, the initial point of this definition is that because you're considering this large volume regime that K is very big, what you're looking at initially is uh, something that's very similar to slope stability of vector bundles. So this more classical theory related to Hermite-Einstein metrics. 
So it's encapsulated by the following proposition, which says is uh, uh, what it says is that if E is asymptotically set stable in the sense, then this actually implies that E is slope semi-stable. Okay, and the, the proof is very easy. Uh, the proof is really just to expand said k of e. I'll always fix this this omega, which determines this uh, uh, this um, yeah all of this input up here to do with uh, train characters and so on. That will be fixed. So then, said k of e, you can expand this. This is rho n k to the n l to the n times the rank of e plus rho n minus one times k to the n minus one l to the n minus one dot to the degree of e uh, plus so on. This has an expansion in k. And then you just really explicitly compare the uh, uh, inequality defining asymptotic z stability to the inequality defining slope stability. And uh, you just see that this, this holds. So it's just an explicit conversation once you take the definition of zk. But uh, this is actually one of the places where you use the hypothesis on the stability vector. So to turn to slightly more analytic matters, it'll be important to recall that a slope semi-stable vector bundle has what's called a Jordan-Holder filtration. So a Jordan filtration. So what is a Jordan-Holder filtration? It's a filtration by subsheaves where they all have the same slope and the quotients are slope stable. So EL, or sorry, EJ mod EJ minus one is slope stable. It's the, the quotient sheaf for all J and with the same slope as E. So what you're supposed to think of as a, a Jordan Holder filtration, it's really giving you a polystable generation of your semi-stable object. So polystable. And the, the polystable generation is really the uh, direct sum of these quotients that I just wrote down of semi stable bundle. Okay, and then the key definition that will allow us to work with the analysis later on is that we'll say that E is sufficiently smooth. If the EL, sorry, the EJ inside E, these are vector subbundles. So, um, this is really a smoothness hypothesis. We're requiring that the Jordan Holder filtration is given by subbundles rather than coherent sheaves in general. So, this terminology was introduced by uh, Lung in the 90s. So, I'm just going to give you a couple examples of central charges that you might be particularly interested in. And these are said k of e is minus the integral over x e to the minus i k l dot c h of e, the total train character. So this is the central charge that people primarily consider in bridge line stability and is motivated really by the physics literature. The other one that's even actually more closely motivated by the physics literature is said k of e is minus the integral over x e to the i k l. So CH of E, but then you take this uh, unipotent uh, operator U to be non-trivial and you take it to be the, the square root of the Todd class of X. And I, don't know, I always find the uh, square root of the Todd class to be slightly mysterious, but you just define it in terms of the power series defining the, the square root function. Okay, so the, the point is that there are lots of already interesting examples of central charges of this form that you can write down. So the original point of this um, work in this talk was to release some kind of variant of bridge line stability to some kind of condition coming from complex geometry. And so the condition in complex differential geometry that will be important then is what we call Z-critical metrics. 
So this is a, a condition on a Hermitian metric on a holomorphic vector bundle that we then conjecture is very closely related to this notion of set stability. And that's then actually something we prove uh, in a very wide range of classes. So what we'll fix a Kähler metric, we're returning to Kähler geometry. We'll fix a representative U tilde of U. So U is some cohomology class, and so I can just pick any turn bay type representative U tilde. So U tilde is some closed differential form. And we'll fix also a Hermitian metric on our holomorphic vector bundle E. So in particular, what this gives you is a representative, representative which I'll call, uh, call Z tilde K of H. So this is the integral over X. And then we sum from D equals zero to N rho D K to the D. And now we just replace where we previously had intersection numbers of line bundles and cohomology classes. We represent the, uh, we considered the uh, churn Bay representative instead. I'm sorry, there's no integral over X here. Uh, so this is omega to the D. And then we take the induced representative of the total churn character defined using the Hermitian metric uh, H. So this is defined, this is curvature defined using the Hermitian metric H on our hallmark vector bundle dot U tilde. So CH tilde of E which really depends on H, this is the churn bay representative. So EG, if you look at the first term class of E, the churn bay representative would be I times the trace of FH. So this is completely familiar part of churn bay theory. So now we make our definition. So we say that H is a Z K critical metric if the imaginary part of E to the I phi of E, so I'll recall that phi of E, this is the argument, this is arg Z K of E. So this is just some uh, number that you construct from the central charge evaluated on this vector bundle E. And okay, then we multiply by Z tilde K of E and we ask that this is zero. So this form, this is an NN form with values in N to E. And you'll recall that I, I originally said that you can rephrase the Hermes Einstein condition as a condition on N of E values and N forms. So this is really actually a, a variant of the Hermes Einstein condition, even though it doesn't look obviously like that. At first, what does this imaginary part mean? So this, I'll say, this really means the skew Hermitian part, but this is something that's familiar in the, the physics literature. They always write this imaginary part to mean that the skew Hermitian part of a Hermitian, uh, of a, a matrix defined using the Hermitian metric. So uh, skew Hermitian part. Okay, so the, the point is that this is some quite complicated looking uh, geometric partial differential equation on the space of Hermitian metrics on a complex vector bundle homomorphic vector bundle that one can associate to the same input that we had when we were defining our notion of said stability. I'll give two examples. And these are really the only two examples that have been studied in the literature. So the first example is that you take said K of E to be this minus the integral over X E to the I K L. So it's CH of E. So I think there should be a minus here. So this leads to an equation that has actually been very heavily studied. So this leads to what's called the deformed mission yang mills equ or Mills equation. So this leads to the deformed Hermitian yang mills equation. Um, so I, what I want to say is that this was actually the equation that motivated Douglas. So this arose kind of simultaneously in the mirror symmetry and uh, string theory literature. 
and it predates bridgeland stability and in particular was even exactly the equation that motivated douglas to define what he calls pi stability which then in turn defined or motivated bridgeland to define bridgeland stability then the other thing I just want to point out is that this other central charge that appears in physics, this leads to some other equation that has also appeared in the physics literature. So the, the equation has been studied in the physics literature, not quite as intensively, but it has been studied. So in string theory. So there are some examples where this equation that we write down um, has been studied, but actually, uh, apart from these two special cases, um, no one has written down any equation like this. And so this should be the kind of general framework in which you can relate geometric PDs to Bridgeland stability conditions. Okay, I, I just want to make one remark really, uh, which is that if you consider the line bundle case, you can ask, how would you ever actually solve this equation? Then the, the point is that actually in the line bundle case, the equation is already non-trivial and it's actually already extremely difficult to study, but it can be rephrased in a way that makes it much more tractable to study. So it asks that the arctan of the real part of Z tilde V over the imaginary part of Z tilde V is equal to zero, oh, sorry, is equal to phi of E plus two pi K. Okay, uh, good. And um, the point is that this condition on arctan of such and such, this is a style of equation that has becoming, uh, has been becoming more popular in the geometric analysis community. So this is an equation that I think actually there are tools to try to understand this sort of equation. So the, this general equation there is some hope to try to understand it analytically in the fairly new, near future. Uh, let's hope. I, I do actually have more remarks, sorry. Uh, the other second remark I'll make is that this appears as a moment map. A moment map equation. So this is actually, I should say, due to uh, Tristan Collins and uh, Shin Tun Yao for the deformed Hermitian Yang Mills case. But moment maps, this is a condition in symplectic geometry that really, once you have a moment map, that's what tells you you should be asking is existence of solutions equivalent to stability. I and mean, this is the general framework in which one should be asking these uh, questions. Uh, the second thing I'd like to say is that this, or third thing, is that the deformed Hermitian Yang Mills equation, which arises as a special case of our equation, this has been uh, very heavily studied in recent years for just for line bundles though. There's really nothing known away from line bundles until our work. So this doesn't really come out of nowhere. And okay, so the, the main theorem, which is due to myself, John, and Lars, So this is uh, a theorem that relates the complex geometry, the solvability of this PDE to the algebraic geometry, namely the stability condition. So our hypothesis is that E is simple and sufficiently smooth. So you'll recall that sufficient smoothness means that the, the polystable degeneration of our slope semi-stable vector bundle is itself a vector bundle rather than a coherent sheaf in general. So it's a smoothness hypothesis. Then we get a complete solution to the, the main goal that we were trying to get at, which was to relate stability to the complex geometry. So E admits ZK critical metrics for all K very large, if and only if E is asymptotically Z stable. Okay, so again, you should remember the hitchin kobashi correspondence tells you that slope stability of a vector bundle is equivalent to 
the existence of a Hermite Einstein metric. So you should think of this as something that establishes a Hitchin, a Hitchin Kobayashi correspondence for Bridgeland stability instead. Uh, what's interesting, or maybe a deficit, or at least should uh, invest in, require investigation and further research is the fact that asymptotic said stability is not actually Bridgeland stability. I mean, it's it's something that seems quite closely related to Bridgeland stability and requires essentially the same input, but it's really a, a different stability notion that only has kind of superficial similarities. So we'll make again some more remarks. Uh, so this regime, the first thing I'd like to say is that the, the large volume regime. Okay, very large. This is the only one that's actually relevant to the physics. I mean, this, this whole story is relevant or motivated by string theory in some sense. And the large volume regime is the only one in which the equations are supposed to be physically relevant. So this is the only. And in particular, actually, from the point of view of geometric analysis, the equations seem to have pretty bad properties for k very small in general. So one, one needs some kind of condition on k, or rather this uh, phase phi of e, you, you might need to require that that some, lies in some uh, angle range in general if you want to actually try to study this equation away from the large volume regime. The second thing to, to return to, what's the point of all of this relating stability conditions to uh, geometric analysis, complex geometry? Well, one thing from our perspective is that this suggests a differential geometric approach to Bridgeland stable objects, so moduli of Bridgeland stable. objects. So okay, uh, Bridgeland stability has been especially useful in studying moduli spaces and the birational geometry of moduli spaces. But you can ask other questions about moduli spaces, like what's their topology or what's their differential geometry. And this sort of approach should be uh, more well suited to that, that style of question. Um, okay, and the, the final thing I want to say is that the equation is already difficult, but much more tractable for line bundles. So the equation is non-trivial. It's non-trivial, but definitely very interesting for line bundles. So this seems to be, especially away from the large volume regime, the, the tractable case that one should study next, especially from the point of view of complex geometry. So in the last um, 10 minutes, I'm certainly not going to prove this result. I mean, it's really a, a theorem in uh, geometric analysis rather than algebraic geometry, but I will say some words about the proof. So what, what sort of scheme do you use to prove a result like this? Okay. Uh, there are two directions, of course, for proving an equivalence between a notion of stability and solvability of a partial differential equation. So typically, the somewhat easier direction is to show that existence implies stability. So I'll just say something about that. So really this uses uh, the sort of general principles of um, complex geometry of holomorphic vector bundles. So this uses general principle of uh, complex geometry, which is that curvature decreases in subbundles. So curvature decreases in subbundles. This was the the key idea in proving that the existence of a Hermite Einstein metric implies slope stability, we use this general principle along with techniques of Lohm in a different problem. So the idea really is then a version of this due to Lohm. And I'll just mention that also Lohm in turn was then motivated by Lupka. Okay, uh, the other direction is the more challenging and interesting one. So this is stability implies existence. So 
So the point is that in the large volume regime, what we're doing is it's, it's basically a preservation problem. So uh, let me just assume that um, the Jordan Holder filtration is zero to S to E. So it just has one step. Uh, so in particular, the polystable generation of E, which is E mod S plus S, I'll, I'll just write uh, the graded object of E. This is isomorphic to E mod S plus S. So this is the, the simplest case. Otherwise you have a, a much more lengthy filtration, but the, the two step or one step filtration cases um, already where there's some challenges. So we'll take the approach that is frequently taken in the study of um, vector bundles. So we'll fix a Hermitian metric instead and vary the complex structure. So instead of looking for a solution to a PDE on the space of Hermitian metrics on a fixed holomorphic vector bundle, we'll fix a Hermitian metric and ask for a solution on the space of complex structures. Okay, then we'll consider um, this family del bar T of del bar operators, essentially degenerating you from E to the graded object G R of E. So del bar E uh, T is on E, but then del bar zero should be on the graded object of E. So you get this uh, generation of complex structure from E to its polystable generation, the graded object of E. Then what we'll consider is the imaginary part. We'll consider epsilon to be K inverse just to ease notation somewhat. Then we'll consider the imaginary part of E to the minus I phi epsilon of E times Z tilde of del bar T. So the point is that we actually have two parameters here. We've got epsilon, which is the, uh, well, it's the inverse of K. So when epsilon is very small, then we're in this large volume regime. And then we have T, which is degenerating us from E to the graded object, um, the polystable degeneration. So I can expand this in these two operators, or these two parameters, epsilon and T. So first of all, I get a expansion in T. So this will be the contraction of omega of F del bar zero minus lambda times the identity omega to the n. Uh, and actually maybe I'll just divide by omega to the n. So instead of thinking about n n forms with values in nd, I'm just thinking of sections of nd plus t times such and such plus t squared times what I'll call alpha plus higher order terms. And then I also get an expansion in powers of epsilon. So I get epsilon times what I'll call beta, and then I'll get O of epsilon squared. And then there's another term that's like uh, epsilon times T and there are mixed terms and so on. But the alpha and the beta terms are the ones that I want to focus on. So it turns out that this T power, this is relevant. And this vanishes. So why does this vanish? This is because uh, sorry, I'll write the, the leading order term, the star term, star vanishes if H, our fixed Hermitian metric, is actually the Hermite Einstein metric on the graded object. So the graded object is slope stable, so it admits a Hermite Einstein metric. Because the leading order term when T and epsilon is zero is actually just. The, the leading order term in the expansion is the Hermite Einstein equation on the graded object to be. Okay, so what do we do? Well, then it turns out just from general complex differential geometry that you show that alpha is strictly positive. By, so it's sort of like a, a general principle, which seems to come from the fact that the Hermite Einstein condition itself is a moment map condition. And what you work out is that miraculously, this term beta, again, actually in, in the simplest case, is 
is just the difference of the objects of interest. So this is phi of E minus phi of E2, I'm oh, sorry, of uh, S. And okay, actually this is like the leading order term in an expansion in epsilon. And the point is that stability allows us to assume that this was actually strictly positive. So what does this tell you? At least if you rescale the speed t, what you get is that there exists a lambda t such that the terms uh, which are t squared alpha and epsilon beta, these, these cancel. Ah, sorry, this should be negative. So the, the point is that this vanishes, this term up here, I'll, I'll use color red. This T term is irrelevant. And the point is that you're canceling the lowest order term in epsilon with the lowest order term in T squared in, in T. So the, the point is that uh, you solve that the equation is zero up to some very reasonable order, and then you can apply a sort of implicit function theorem, an inverse function theorem argument. So then finally, you repeat this sort of process and you apply the, the quantitative inverse function theorem. Okay, and, and so that's the end. Uh, this final part, this is really a piece of geometric analysis. It's a sort of perturbation problem, but what you should take away is that there is, it seems, an approach to studying bridge line stability by using complex differential geometry. And it seems to us there should be many things one can ask about this notion of stability, which really is a variant of bridge line stability rather than being exactly the same. But especially there are lots of interesting questions that one can ask about this uh, PDE that we write down. Uh, so yes, uh, thanks for listening, that's, that's everything. Thank you, Roya. I think the speaker. Okay, questions, please.